Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, third installment of an eight-part seminar series on the topic of discussion today being continental trade integration through the full implementation of the AFCFTA and really looking at its impacts on poverty and income. My name is Nyiko Koza and I'm a program officer at the African Union Development Agency. Uh, for those that are joining us for the very first time, welcome to you. Uh, and as mentioned, this is the third part of an eight eight part series, really where each session has been designed to focus on a specific development area. And ultimately the outcomes of all of these discussions will serve as an input into a think tank inception conference that will be held later this year from the 26th to the 28th of September in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia on Africa's integrated development prospects. Now, the AEDA NAPIT Africa Policy Bridge Tank Program, in collaboration with the African Futures and Innovation Program at the Institute for Security Studies, is jointly hosting this seminar, which aims to describe the impacts of the full implementation of the AFCFTA and really looking at what the implications would be in particular on income and poverty and really in terms of the greater development trajectory. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement aims to create Africa's first continent-wide free trade area. And now if fully implemented, it could raise incomes by 9% by the year 2035 and lift a staggering 50 million people out of extreme poverty. And according to a report that was recently launched, launched by the UN Trade and Development Body, with productivity boosting measures, the AFCFT agreement could reduce poverty and inequality while spurring sustainable uh, and inclusive growth and really putting us as Africa on a great trajectory to really attain some of the ambitions that are stated in our agenda 2063. Now, before I hand over to our presenter, I'd like to encourage all participants to please post your questions in the Q&A chat box somewhere on the screen. And we will make enough time later on um, for me to either read the questions to our presenters or provide you um, with an opportunity to pose them yourself. Now, today our presenter is Mr. Blessing Tapanda, who is a senior researcher at the ISS, and he has extensive experience in providing forecasts for use in planning, as well as decision making. Also joining him will be two very esteemed uh, discussants, who I also look forward to hearing uh, from. Firstly, we'll have Dr. Mustafa Sakir. He is the principal program officer who's heading the trade and markets unit at the African Union Development Agency. And I see Mustafa, your camera is on. So perhaps just give us a wave to let us know that you are ready for this morning. Okay, a nod will also do a wave. There you go. Thank you very much and welcome Mustafa. Um, also joining Mustafa will be Mr. George Boateng. He is a senior policy analyst at the African Center for Economic Transformation. Uh, and George, if you can also just switch on your camera and, oh, there's your camera is on and give a bit of a wave. Uh, welcome gentlemen. I really do look forward to really the engaging discussions um, that we will have over the next hour or so. Now, as we move on and really getting into what I would call the meat of our session this morning, uh, Mr. Chipanda will provide us with a 15 minute presentation that will demonstrate really the effects of trade um, on economic development and really show us how Africa can actually benefit from the full implementation of um, the AFCFTA. Mr. Chipanda, without any further ado, allow me to invite you. We are all ears. You can take the virtual floor, sir. Thank you so much. Um, let me share my screen with you guys. Okay. Can you all see my screen? I can confirm, yes, blessing, your screen is visible. Okay, thank you so much. Um, 
Uh, let me just give you a brief about uh, what we do at Africa Future and Innovation. So at Africa Future and, and Innovation, we model and forecast the long-term future of Africa and each African country. We use an econometric model that is known as IFS. IFS stands for International Futures. Uh, the model is hosted and developed by the University of Denver in the United States. So for more information about the model, you can click uh, from our website, you can click uh, on about section, you can go about this site, you will read a lot about the model. Okay, okay let me go back. You can read a lot here yeah, about the model, how the model works. Um, uh, what we do, we, our forecast time horizon is 2043. 2043 is the end of the third 10-year implementation plan for the African Union Agenda 2063. So last week, my colleague uh, presented to you the, Africa, the agricultural theme. And the previous week, it was the demographic theme. So today, I'm going to present um, our African continent of free trade theme. I'll be presenting from our website. Um, uh, I hear people complaining, saying sometimes we don't see your website. The other way to visit our website is to go through the main website, the ISS website. If you go to research, you'll see us here, Africa Future. So, okay, let's start our presentation. Okay, so the theme looks at the long-term future of Africa with the full implementation of AFTA. So if AFTA is fully implemented, it's going to be the largest trade agreement in the world. It's going to create a market size of about 1.3 billion. The trade agreements aims at removing tariffs and non-tariff barriers, creating an opportunity for the development of regional value chain within the continent, and also to increase the continent competitiveness in the global value chain, thereby expanding Africa's intra and extra trade. So the agreement is not just about the exchange of goods and services. It's, it's about uh, creating a roadmap for the development of Africa. It is a milestone toward reducing poverty in Africa. Yeah, so let's look at the progress. Uh, what has been done so far? So the agreement was officially launched uh, on the 1st of January 2021. However, 47 member states have rectified the agreement. Seven have signed the agreement. And so one country, which is Eritrea, has not yet signed the agreement. They have agreed on 90% of the product to, to be fully liberalized. And they are targeting to fully liberalize about 97% of the product by 2033. 7% of the products will have about 10% tariff. And they are mostly agricultural products. 3% of the product are excluded from the agreement and they are going to be reviewed in 2024. And 88% of the rules of origins have been agreed on and certificate of origins are being issued. Only 33 countries have signed the protocol of free movement of people and only four have rectified uh, the, the, the protocol, and the four are Rwanda, Niger, Malawi, Mali, sorry, Mali, and Sao Moto and Principal. And the big guys, which is South Africa and, and Nigeria, they have not yet signed the protocol for free movement of people. So currently, Africa is the poorest region in the world in terms of um, economic development and GDP size. So in terms of um, its trade, um, its total trade accounts for about 3% of the total world trade. Okay, in this chart, uh, I'm showing you the percentage of, uh, of trade, of world trade that Africa has. This is the green line. Then we have got the blue line, which is Asia, which is also another developing country. And we have got the OECD here. And on the other side, we have got the percentage share of GDP. 
So Africa, in terms of GDP, in 2021, the share of GDP in world GDP, it was about 3%. Its total export was about 2.8% and uh, its import was 2.8%. And uh, from our current, current path forecast, um, we expect uh, that um, total trade to remain low and stagnant. And total trade uh, by 2024, it will account for about 4.7% in 2020, 2020, 2043. And the GDP, is, the GDP share will also remain low and stagnant at about 4.9%. We can also look at the, the actual value from the chart. At actual values. Okay, let's hope my internet is fast enough. Okay, so here is the trend in terms of um, uh, the actual values. You can see Africa a slight increase up to 2043, and we can see that Asia is catching up with uh, the OECD in terms of total trade. And we can also see here that in terms of GDP per capita, the OECD, they've got the highest GDP per capita and uh, Africa has the lowest when we compare to the other developing region, which is Asia. Um, let's have a look at um, the intertrade uh, relative to other region, the intertrade for Africa. So in 2021, um, Africa's intertrade, which is trade within Africa, or within African country accounted for about 15%. Uh, when uh, compared to about, um, uh, about 55% for Asia, Africa is the green line, Asia is the yellow one, and Europe is the blue one. The Europe was, uh, the intra-trade in Europe was about um, 69% in 2021. So we can see that, uh, Africa trade more with other region than its trade with, the, with each other. So let's look at uh, the trade composition for Africa. So from the trade composition, we can see that Africa export, oh, what's up with my second? Africa export more of homogeneous products, which are primary and resource-based goods. Uh, in the literature, they say that uh, primary and resource-based goods are considered poor country goods. And those countries that continue specializing and exporting those kind of goods will remain poor. So Africa needs to, to diversify its export composition away from primary and resource-based goods into more of uh, medium and high technology goods. So when we look at the import composition, Africa import more of heterogeneous goods, which are machinery and equipment, or we can call them capital goods. So in the literature, not all imports are bad. Capital goods or machinery or equipment are embodied with the technology that can promote uh, productivity and innovation and more and more productive firm are more likely to be exporters. So far, the continent is far removed from the technological frontier. Therefore, Africa needs to import more of these capital goods or industrial technology in order to produce and innovate, and in order to promote its regional value chain, in order for it to export more of such kind of goods, capital goods, which are medium and high technology goods. So let's move to uh, what we do in our scenario. So in our scenario, we intervene on tariff and non-tariff barriers according to the agreement that was made. We push on productivity, we push on exports, we also put on trade promotion or export promotion. So what, uh, what was agreed upon? Okay, this is the tariff line. 
So 90% 90, 90 of the product, we have a zero tariff and they are considered non-sensitive products. They will have a full liberalization uh, uh, in different periods according to, to the classification that we have here, non-least developing country, least developing country, and uh, there is a, a group called G6. Because we know that, okay, we know that um, the reason why they did that, it's because you know that Africa, um, African countries are different, are differentiated uh, in terms of size, level of economic development and diversity. So whenever there is such a trade agreement or regional trade agreement, there is likely to be trade creation or trade diversion. So to avoid some challenges, that's how they managed to classify least and non-least developing country. And we also had a group of countries, which is uh, what we call G6, that complain that uh, we are facing some development challenges. So give us some diff different treatment. So those countries, um, um, are Zimbabwe, uh, Madagascar, Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, Malawi, uh, Ethiopia and Sudan. And the red one, these are non least developing countries, and the yellow ones are least developing countries. So let's look at the, the results after we do our scenario. Okay, I'm going to take you back to the first chart uh, that I showed you. I'm going to show you the impact on total trade and GDP. Uh, from our scenario. This is the scenario. Okay. Sometimes. Okay, the internet's a bit slow. Sometimes you need to refresh. Okay. So okay, this is the yellow line. So the green line, the internet, what's up with the internet? Okay. Sorry about the internet. So so the dark green line is our current past forecast which is the in, in, in the business as usual platform. So in the current path, and this is our scenario now, after the intervention, after doing all the intervention, we see that Africa's share of total trade is going to increase from about 4.5% to about 8, to about 8.2% in 2043. Our GDP per capita, it's going to increase, GDP per capita is going to increase from 7.1 billion to 7.1 thousand to 7.8 thousand. We can also look at the percentage. This is the absolute value. You can also look at the percentage. We see a small increase in share of Africa total trade. We also see a small increase in GDP at market exchange rate. Let's look at the impact on, on economic growth. So the dark green is our, our current path forecast and uh, the light green is our scenario, the impact of our scenario. So in 2043, we see an increase in growth from 2.5%, 2 2.2% to 6.4%. We can also, from this chart, we can also see the growth for each and every African country, uh, each regional economic group or each income group. For example, Let's look at South Africa. Where is South Africa? Oh, the internet. Okay. okay, let's just look at Algeria. So we can see in Algeria that in 2043, the growth will increase from 2.3% in the current path forecast to 3.6% in our after scenario. 
Let's look at the impact of poverty. The impact on poverty. Okay. So in 2043, um, the scenario will reach 36,200 million people will be lifted out of extreme poverty at $1.90. Uh, we can also look here at um, the percentage changes for Africa. So in 2043, about 1.6% of African population will be lifted out of extreme poverty. We can, from this chart, we can also look at each and every African country, each and every regional economic group and income level. So let's look at the impact on income. In absolute value, we can say that there will be more gain in more gains in Nigeria, followed by Ethiopia, South Africa, and Algeria. We can also look at the percentage gains relative to the current path. When it comes, wait, okay, it's, it didn't change. Okay, sorry. So, in terms of percentage changes relative to the current path or relative to the business as usual, in 2043, uh, income gain for Burundi will increase by 22% relative to the current path, followed by the income for Kenya, Sato, and Algeria. Let's look at the impact on our trade. Okay, let's start by the values. So the duck, the duck line is our current path forecast. And this is the impact of our scenario. So in value terms, Africa's exports by 2043 will increase from 2.2 billion to 4.1 billion. The share of our trade uh, relative to world trade will increase from about 4.3% in the current path forecast to about 7.9% uh, in our trade scenario in 2043. We can also look at uh, each African country, the impact of, uh, of our scenario on export for each and African country and each region. Let's look at the imports, the increase in imports. Okay, the absolute values. So here we can see that in 2043, uh, our imports will increase from 2.7 billion in the current path to about 4.3 billion in our trade scenario in 2043. Let's look at the share of imports in world trade. So the share of Africa's imports will increase from two from five point two percent to eight point four percent of world imports in 2043. Okay, let's uh, check the gains by sectors after the full implementation of after. So from this chart, the blue line, the blue bar is our current path and um, the yellow bar is our scenario, our trade scenario after scenario. So we can see that there will be more gains in the manufacturing and service sectors. 
in the service sectors. We can also look here, the percentage changes relative to the current path within these sectors. Okay, sorry. Okay, so if you look at the percentage changes relative to the current path, we can see that there will be more gains in the service sectors followed by the manufacturing sectors. Then at the, bo at the, at the bottom we have uh, the energy sector. Okay, so let's look at um, the gains at sector level and country level. So in the manufacturing sector, Nigeria, we have the largest gain followed by Egypt, Algeria, South Africa. Uh, we can also look at the percentage gains. So when you compare to the percentage gains relative to the current path, we can see that, okay, there'll be an increase, there'll be more increase in Algeria in the manufacturing sector, more gains from the, man, from, from the manufacturing sector. It will be Algeria, Ethiopia, Sudan, Burundi. We can also look at other sectors. We have the agriculture sector here. Which country will gain the most in absolute value? We have got Cote d'Ivoire, Morocco, South Africa. We can also look at the energy sector. In the energy sector, we have Algeria, Angola, Gabon, Egypt. Uh, we can, let's look at the IT, ICT. In the ICT, we have got Egypt, South Africa, Ethiopia, Morocco, Tunisia. Uh, we can also look at this, the service sector. In the service sector, we have Nigeria, Egypt, South Africa, Morocco, and Ethiopia. So we have seen the impact of the full implementation of AFTA. So what African government must do? The African government must conclude AFTA as planned and ensure that it covers investment and competition policy they might they must build a broad public support increase the role of public sector they might must promote favorable and complementary national trade policy industrial policy and competition policy they must promote the importation of capital goods from advanced economies as we know that um, um, capital goods uh, the world capital goods are mostly concentrated in advanced economy. About 80% of, 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 te of high technology, of our technology are concentrated in the top 10 advanced economy. So Africa needs to take advantage of um, importing capital goods and use them effectively and efficiently. African government also must provide predictable business for business to expand operation. Okay, I'll end my presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, thank I'll you very much. Sharing. Okay, no, fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Blessing. And I think we will give you a virtual round of applause for really presenting a really thorough, thorough report, you know, in, in, the, in the few minutes um, that you had. And let me just really thank you and congratulate really yourselves and the team um, that was really behind the development um, of this report. And quite a number of, you know, issues coming up that I've noted as well to say thank you so much for really painting a picture of not where we currently stand as the continent in terms of the free trade agreement, but when we begin to model what its full implementation would look like, that is quite riveting. And of course, seeing 
what the impacts would be um, in, in different sectors, such as agriculture and manufacturing. And I think, in fact, when we look at um, those sectors, manufacturing, agriculture, uh, and services, I think it really does give a, a marching call to you know, our governments to say, what do they do now to position their respective countries to fully benefit from the implementation um, of the AFCFTA? Um, and I think this also does raise questions as well in terms, you know, which are those countries that stand to benefit more and which are those that stand to benefit a bit less and what really is being done or can be done, uh, you know, about that particular situation. But also I think ending it really on, on a note that says, this is where we could be should we, should we be able to fully implement the AFCFTA, but also what then do we need to do to really realize the benefits um, that the AFCFTA actually presents? So once again, uh, blessing and the team, thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we will now move to hear from um, our two discussants, really seeing what, what their thoughts are in terms of the report. Um, are there any areas that they would really want to focus on or emphasize, or perhaps really provoking us to think even beyond uh, you know, some of the elements um, that have been presented this morning? Um, so we'll be hearing from George shortly. So George is a senior policy analyst at the Center for Economic Transformation, uh, as mentioned earlier on. Um, this is a pan-African economic policy think tank, think tank um, working in the fields of development, uh, microeconomics, trade, and agriculture. George also has research interests and skills and in private sector development. Um, his policy interests focus on strengthening linkages between research and policy through open dialogue. He holds a master's degree in rural development and management from the China Agricultural University and also holds a certificate in evaluating social programs from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Wow, really accomplished gentleman. I'm still not finished, George, reading all of your accomplishments here. <laughs> a certificate in climate change from the United Nations Institute uh, for Training and Research, and a certificate in new structural economics from Peking University. Uh, also previously a Southern Voices Network Scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, DC. So ladies and gentlemen, an extremely accomplished gentleman. Uh, George, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Nico. Um, and I, 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 I want to re-echo your sentiments about um, the report and thank Blessing for a very interesting presentation. Um, the authors have produced some, some very good report. It's, it's evidence informed um, on the challenges and the prospects of the African trade um, agreement. I mean, going through the report, what one thing that struck me is its, it's meticulous attention to divergent and convergent processes in identifying trends and impacts of the AFTA on multiple indicators. It basically offers us a glimpse into the future, what we can achieve um, together as a people. And what, what, one interesting thing is that it, is, it dismisses um, the notion that political will is alone is insufficient. It's sufficient for the full implementation of the AFTA. Um, one particular valuable aspect of the report is this emphasis on deepening trade integration in the regional economic communities and also prioritizing regional value chains ac across the continent. But from, from the report, I, there are five key, key issues that emerge the structural challenges of African economies, trade liberalization among a diverse set of African countries, the persistence of non-tariff barriers, and the necessity for regional collaboration to drive this agreement, and also a cross-cutting issue about leadership, which I'll touch on later in my submission. But uh, allow me to share my perspectives on three of these issues that I've raised. Um, I mean, regional integration, you all know, is a powerful vehicle to address Africa's structural challenges. Um, we have heard from Blazin about Africa, Africa's heavy reliance on upstream commodity exports, which has led to an increased trade deficit with the rest of the world. But while economic growth is 
symposium that alone cannot resolve African structural challenges. Um, to tackle these issues effectively, African economies must diversify their manufacturing, services, and export sectors. They need to also enhance competitiveness in non-extractive exports by increasing productivity across agriculture, manufacturing, construction, and the services industry, and going further to upgrade their technological cap capabilities to produce exports, uh, medium and high tech goods. What's made, not what we are looking for is to raise per capita income, to improve welfare outcomes and address inclusivity. I mean, if you look at Africa's performance in economic transformation or, or structural transformation over the past, let's say two decades, it has been at best uh, disappointing on most of the dimensions I, I mentioned earlier. Um, diversification, export competitiveness, productivity, which are crucial catalysts for, for, for the trade agreement. Um, has, I mean, when you look at those indicators, excuse me, when you look at, I mean, those indicators, are, as I mentioned earlier, they have not performed so well. Um, sorry, I have my news crumbled. They have they have basically not performed so well, and I mean you find a weakness in, in in most of these indicators. When you look at progress in technological upgrades, they have also not been have not been consistent across the continent. Um, there's a there's a forthcoming report, the African Transformation Report, that addresses some of these issues um, by by measuring them, and uh, it's, it's going to come out very soon. Now I hope that everybody can have a look at that report. But I want to move on beyond the structural challenges that I've mentioned to look at issues of tariff and non-tariff barriers, which persist and uh, is, is extensively discussed in the report. Recently, um, assets went into a memorandum of understanding with the government of Rwanda to try and uh, um, look at the impacts of the trade agreements on the economy of Rwanda. And the results of the modeling exercise indicate that Rwanda will be a major beneficiary of tariff elimination under the AFTA. Um, we are looking at Rwanda getting welfare gains of around 300, over 300 million dollars um, when, when uh, tariffs are liberalized at least at about 97 percent. We are also looking at intra-Africa exports in Rwanda being projected to increase substantially whilst other African countries experience smaller gains due to persistent non-tariff barriers. These findings, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to build an argument, that these file findings highlight the importance of addressing non-tariff barriers to free trade. Um, tariff elimination alone is insufficient. There's also an issue of aligning domestic policies to continental protocols. That can be also very challenging when national policies are weak or non-existent. One critical uh, thing I want to look at is the issue of digital protocol or the digital economy. This protocol we are, we are, we are, we are told is being negotiated as we speak. And, um, but many African countries lack national policies for digital trade. If you look at evidence from the UNCTAD uh, Global Tracker, it's clear that at least one third of African countries do not have um, digital, uh, digital policies to support this protocol. And I mean, moreover, when we look at the issue of labor mobility, and I'm happy that the presenter touched on this issue, only four African countries have ratify the AU free movement of persons protocol. This, I mean, we cannot have a free trade area if uh, labor mobility is, is not being allowed to, 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 to flourish in Africa. Further, further down the line, when you look at the absence or dysfunctionality of labor market information systems, this hamper labor mobility and investments. Um, also proper implementation of mutual recognition agreements in the regs is lacking. This raises a lot of concern about the efficacy within the AFTA framework. Now, African countries will, of course, require a lot of support 
um, to, to plug the deficit when tariffs are liberalized, but they will even need more support to, to overcome non tariff measures, capacity building issues, issues of institutional reform, issues of new institutions needing to be created, and even issues of coordination. Uh, and beyond those, we, we, are, we are looking at uh, streamlining border processes, um, also enhancing the movement of people across border and so on. But I, I want to um, end here by putting up the last one, which is very critical to, to, um, to all these discussions. The whole issue of regional collaboration to drive the AFTA is very important. Um, maybe I'll define what I mean by regional collaboration. It essentially means that um, we are collaborating as, as, an, as an African continent to provide public goods and services that extend beyond borders. It basically entails solving national problems that require regional solutions. So, I mean, this collaboration could involve enhancing transport corridors and connectivity. You could also look at the whole issue of harmonizing taxes on the extractive industry, mainly to combat smuggling and how we reduce regulatory barriers to regional communication networks and also the financial markets. Also fostering cooperation efforts. When you look at what Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire have done recently, on collaborating on the price of regulation in the cocoa sector is remarkable. And uh, I believe, and I strongly believe that more collaboration rather than conflict is needed between Egypt and let's say Sudan and Ethiopia on the Grand Renaissance uh, Dam. Because this one, this dam could drive regional energy markets. It could boost industrialization on the continent. It's, it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. And I think they should look at collaboration rather than conflict. So, I mean, regional collaboration can also, again, facilitate productive employment, enabling cross-border movement of people, labor and professional services. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll end here, but before I end, I want to make um, one more statement. Um, as I earlier mentioned, I, 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 I note, I, and you note, I noted the importance that while political role is necessary, Dedicated leadership at all levels is crucial to drive the full implementation of the AFT. I, what, what African leaders should be looking at is visions that go beyond national interest and looking at the co collective good for, a common, um, for, 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 for the common good. I mean, we have to understand that the African trade uh, agreement has the power to transform the continent, as we have seen from the scenarios. We have seen what the future looks like. We have seen the various uh, ways we can go about using the free trade agreement. But we also have to understand that to realize its full potential, we need to overcome certain challenges. And I want to recap, recap this, some of these challenges. The structural issues of the, of the African economy need to be addressed. We cannot continue on the exporting um, upstream commodities and expect um, the changes to our economies. We need to move into capital export and imports. We also need to reduce tariffs, and more importantly, to reduce non-tariff barriers. We also need to foster collaboration to enhance connectivity, both the soft and the hard infrastructure. And I believe this will play a vital role in shaping the Africa that we aspire to create. Thank you very much. Over to you, Nico. Thank you very much, uh, George. Once again, we are giving you a virtual round of applause and thank you so much uh, for those reflections uh, on the report uh, that, that has been presented this morning. And I think I'd like what you said when you started. You said that uh, political will alone will not really lead us into a place where the AFCFTA agreement is fully implemented, but it will really take a number of other, uh, whether it's initiative or actions for us to really fully realize the implementation of the AFCFTA. Um, you also spoke about another really key element, and I think this is absolutely instrumental. It is the extent to which you know national governments are actually able to domesticate uh, into their national policies, uh, you know, some of these AFCFTA protocols to actually make them, you know, embedded in, in, in their national plans as well. And I think that will go a long way uh, in really Africa being able to achieve the full implementation of the AFCFTA and to really benefit from it. So thank you very much um, for that, George. 
We'll now move um, swiftly along to our next um, discussant. This is Dr. Mustafa Sak. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, Dr. Sakhar, he is a principal program officer um, heading the trade and market unit at the African Union Development Agency. Uh, he brings along with him 20 years of multilateral economic diplomacy experience, um, of which about 10 years or so, um, he was serving in field missions across uh, the continent and within the African Union. He also has advanced research interests in international trade uh, and industrialization related issues, both at national and multi multilateral levels with a proven track record um, of publications. Uh, Dr. Sakhar holds a PhD in international economics from the University of Pretoria and also holds a master's and bachelor's degree um, in economics obtained from Cairo University um, in Egypt. In addition to this, uh, Dr. Sakir holds, you know, diplomas in product management and multilateral um, diplomacy. Uh, and of course, it goes without saying from what I am reciting here, that uh, this is a, a, an incredibly certified um, expert by different institutions such as, you know, World Trade Organization, uh, UNCTAD, uh, and UNECA. Dr. Sakir, over to you, very keen as well to hear what your reflections are on the report. Uh, over to you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Nico. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, echo uh, the big uh, round of applause for uh, Blessing and the uh, ISS drafting team for such a brilliant report, which, uh, in my opinion, it's very timely and very important uh, to enrich the ongoing discussion about what uh, the expected uh, impact of the ACFTA to further expedite the inclusive and sustainable development process in Africa. Uh, having said that, I would like to re reflect on a couple of issues after reading the very brilliant report before the, this event and also based on the uh, perfect and enlightening presentations done by Blessing. Uh, first of all, I would like to raise some uh, is uh, issues about the ACFTE scenario uh, included uh, in this uh, uh, report. It's mentioned in the report that uh, the uh, it's as assumed that the implementation of the ACFTE uh, starts will starts by early 2024. I think we may need to revise this assumption a little bit, bearing in mind the first group of countries, which is non uh, least developing countries, uh, are expected to fully eliminate 90% of the tariffs. Uh, by the end of 2024. So I think we may assume that the beginning of 2025 could be the earliest uh, realistic assumption, assuming that the business sector and the private sector will be able to uh, reap uh, the impacts of uh, this tariff implementation directly after uh, all the first group of countries will start uh, uh, reducing it or phasing it out. Uh, my second uh, issue in relation also to the scenario, it's, uh, I fully concur with uh, what's already mentioned uh, by Blessing and also by uh, the previous discussion, uh, George, regarding the importance of the tariff and non-tariff barrier reductions. But also we shouldn't forget the issue of trade facilitation. We all uh, were that the ECFD uh, uh, agreement or, uh, will be implemented by uh, and facilitated by uh, measures to facilitate trade uh, through the implementation of trade facilitation agreement. So I think um, at some point we need to, to highlight this issue and to take it into, into our consideration while uh, calibrating uh, our uh, scenario and model. Away from the scenario, I would like to uh, reflect also on the very pertinent outcomes uh, presented by Blessing and also in the report, which in my opinion uh, need further uh, reflection on what is the indication and what are the implications. Uh, it, it, it caught my eyes that it's mentioned that the average increase, uh, increase in the GDP of Africa in the ACFT secretariat, uh, ACFT uh, scenario compared to the current path scenario is on average around uh, 4.6. So again, from your own perspective, uh, blessing and the uh, ISS team, how do you perceive this uh, finding vis-a-vis uh, -vis the high expectation attached to the ACFT uh, 
as a game changer for the development process in Africa, and also vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the impact of other continental and regional, uh, regional uh, uh, free trade area, area like NAFTA, uh, European Union, also in Asia. So how do you perceive this is finding? Is it, uh, so in, in other words, does the findings support the assumption that ACFTA will be a real game changer or not? Um, again, this, uh, ju just to give more indication to our policymakers at all levels, just uh, before waiting till the end of uh, Agenda 2064, uh, to, to see whether these uh, agreements are uh, adequate enough uh, or not. Uh, also, one of the um, very interesting finding, the uh, finding uh, highlighted by the report, uh, I can see that there is a real impact or significant impact of uh, applying the ACFTA from the first year on uh, the GDP growth and also our trade. But uh, when it comes to the impact on poverty, uh, I can see it takes a while to see a significant difference between the two trajectories reflecting the current path forecast and the uh, ACFTE uh, uh, included uh, uh, path. So again, why is that? Uh, this is due to the structural challenges of the African uh, embedded uh, clearly in the African continent or not. Or not. We need, I think, uh, to reflect a little bit on the indication and the implications of these uh, findings, again, to inform an evidence-based uh, policy recommendation. Uh, also, uh, as far as we are concerned about the tracking and examining the impact of the implementation of the ACFTE uh, on uh, income and uh, poverty reduction, uh, for example, uh, I would appreciate if you could a little bit further expand our analysis to focus on what is the real impact on the micro, small and medium enterprises sector. As you may aware, currently the majority of economic activities, it's around 90% of economic activity in Sub-Saharan Africans are uh, led uh, by uh, the uh, small and medium enterprises sector. So again, uh, to what extent the uh, implementation of these uh, continent treated areas likely to boost to improve this sector and what will be the implication when it comes to the mitigating or uh, exacerbating the, the impact on the poverty. Uh, also, it clearly mentioned that the implementation of the ACT is likely to be triggered by uh, a certain structural change in, uh, in Africa, favoring the growth of manufacturing and service sector. Definitely, it's likely to, uh, to trigger positive imp implications when it comes to the productivity and the growth of the GDP. But on the other side, it's likely to raise a lot of challenges, being in mind that the majority of the African labor forces are likely to be uh, active in the agriculture sector. So again, for, uh, as we discuss the impact on poverty and, uh, and poverty reduction. So what are the uh, main, uh, I would say, indirect implications of uh, applying the ACFTA on uh, how to qualify those who are currently active in the agriculture sector uh, to be easily uh, moved to the expected to grow sectors like manufacturing and the productivity sector as well. Uh, last but not least uh, issue that I would like to, to reflect here again, uh, we all agree and we all aware that uh, there will be losers and winners of the implementation of the ACT, not only on the, between countries, but also within countries, between uh, economics, different economic sectors. So again, how, how do we expect uh, governments to address this issue, uh, particularly uh, internally? So again, uh, is it, do we expect a more effective uh, safety nets uh, and uh, social solidarity measures to mitigate the risk, particularly on the most vulnerable groups of the population or not. Uh, having said that, I uh, would like to uh, thank again the Blessing and ISS team for uh, drafting such a brilliant report, which we really need to inform the ongoing discussion. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saka. Really uh, insightful comments there. And I think I must say, I, I, I'm absolutely captured by, by what you mentioned, uh, you know, towards the end when you said, you know, when we talk about the AFCFTA implementation, there will be losers, there will be winners. And I think oftentimes this is not a sentiment that is, you know, publicized that much, but I think that really 
when we are looking at the AFCFTA, it would do uh, you know, our, our governments great justice to look at this particular element to really ensure that you know, we build in proper safety nets and mitigating actions as well to ensure that you know, those countries, for example, that rely quite heavily uh, uh, on tariffs and, and, and whatnot really don't find themselves in a very negative situation. So thank you so much for bringing in that really thought-provoking um, element. You also brought in other elements that we need to take um, into account when we talk AFCFTA, for example, elements relating to trade facilitation, um, but you also mentioned that there might be other elements, you know, that the report might want, you know, to further focus on and reflect on, uh, you know, for example, what the impact of really the full implementation um, of the AFCFTA would be, for example, on, on MSMEs. So thank you very much um, for that, Dr. Mustafa, and thank you so much, George, um, as well. And I think you've really helped us to begin to really interrogate, you know, the outcomes of the report and already begin to think of, you know, what are those, some of those burning questions and elements that we need to take um, into consideration. We now are heading three minutes to the bottom of the hour. Uh, I must say we do intend to close this session really at the latest uh, 12.45. I really do want to enable a lot of some time for engagement and for questions um, to be posed. So please do feel free to continue posing some of your questions um, in the Q&A chat box. Uh, and of course, if you are feeling brave, feel free to you know, raise your hand and I will call upon you uh, to verbalize um, your question. So let me just quickly head on to the chat box. And while I do so, perhaps to also reiterate um, you know, to Blessing um, that there's a lot of appreciation for the report, um, comments coming in, really saying it's quite insightful and, and really thought provoking um, as well. You know, there's a particular question that I saw that I actually, uh, while I scrolled down in the hope that I find it quite quickly. Um, and I think this question was from, just get, yes, there we're gonna hope I am pr pronouncing it correctly, um, from Iwa. Um, and, and the question says, you know, what are the mechanisms to monitor effective implementation uh, of the AFCFTA? And if non-state actors are involved in such a process, I think it's an absolutely uh, you know, important question to reflect on. So perhaps, Blessing, let me hand over to you to say, in the work that you are doing, have you identified any monitoring mechanisms to ensure that indeed we reach this future of a fully implemented trade agreement? Over to you, Blessing. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> That's a good question. Uh, um, we can't model that in our scenario. Yep. Okay. So Listen, far, if I can, model. if I can perhaps come in just to add to that, I think that really it falls outside the scope of what we do. It's maybe a question that should be directed at order NEPAD because we are not part of the formal systems uh, that uh, relate to the, uh, to the continental free trade area. Um, we only model the impact. So maybe order NEPAD or somebody from, from the Africa Union can comment on that. But I don't think Blessing can, can respond to that. Sorry for... No, no, but that makes sense because you did the scope of it yeah, doesn't get covered there. Thank you so much, uh, uh, you know, for 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 noting that, uh, Jackie. And of course, I see, I see George's cameras on. Perhaps yeah. you might want to pine on that. Yeah, I mean, um, beyond the, the work of the AFTA secretariat, which is based here in Accra, um, I, I think there's there are, there are efforts. I mean, to establish the African Trade Observatory, which is taxed with. Um, the work of monitoring how countries are, 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 are implementing the AFTA. Um, and also, we, I mean, beyond the Africa Trade Observatory, that is the main um, institutional organ that is doing the monitoring. There is also, I mean, other institutions such as the UNECA, which is heavily involved in helping countries uh, develop national strategies uh, for implementation of the AFTA. And also, even what, what other countries are, are doing, 
and in our work with um, in our work with, um, on on the guide with countries in the guided trade initiative. Um, what countries are also doing to help is that most countries have established um, a DEX in the Ministry of Trade, which are mostly coordination offices that are tasked with day-to-day uh, -day coordination and implementation on the ground of the AFTA. So, I mean, there's a lot of work and coordination going on, but I think uh, more needs to be done, of course, but they are, they are, they are institutional frameworks that, that are monitoring some of these issues. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, thank you very much um, for, for that, George. To note that there is work that is ongoing that really seeks to monitor um, the implementation of the trade agreement. Uh, I'm gonna read out a couple more questions and this time I'm really feel free to any of um, our respondents as well to, to respond um, if you feel that you do have anything to add. I've got a really specific question here from Amit Jain, uh, which says, how does Algeria um, stand to benefit so much more uh, in, in manufacturing than any other country? And here they cite that perhaps the manufacturing industries uh, or sector in countries such as Kenya or South Africa, even Morocco, might be a bit more advanced. Just a little bit of um, saying how, how did that element, uh, uh, how was that element reached? Um, then perhaps while we think about that one, there's also another very good question here coming from uh, Noma Khrut, who I'm very keen to maybe hear uh, in the work that you've done, Blessing, as, as you are you know, modeling what, what this full implementation might look like, that does this process also take into account you know, externalities? For example, we've just come out or are still grappling with the effects of, of a global pandemic, for example. So does this modeling element take into account Account those kinds of external uh, factors or elements um, as well. So maybe let me pose those two questions. And of course, panelists, please do feel free to, to, to chip in. Okay, thank you. Um, about Algeria, it, it, it depends with the economic model in Algeria. Um, um, also on, on uh, different indicators like the education, how is the age of the human capital, how is um, um, the population size. So because we use uh, historical data. So the forecast is based on the historical data. So the, our forecast is based on those uh, elements what the GDP says, what is, uh, what is the level of human capital in Algeria, what is uh, the financial flow investment in Algeria to do that forecasting. And in terms of externalities, uh, I'm not quite sure what uh, the, uh, what, what exactly does the person mean? Does it mean in terms of externality, positive and negative externality of the implementation of after? If we look at the negative externality, like uh, one of the commentators said, uh, Mustafa, he spoke about the issue of losers and, 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 and winners. But sometimes to say that when you are presenting, and maybe if I say that um, Algeria will lose, and there is a representative of Algeria, they would not want to, to participate in the agreement. So what I did was just to use the word trade creation and trade diversion to avoid using such uh, words that express the negative externalities of uh, the full implementation of AFTA. Of course, there will be losers, there will be winners. Some countries will lose their revenue. Some countries they depend mostly on, on, on tariff revenue. So if all the tariffs have been eliminated, there won't be uh, any revenue, but the impact will only be on the in the short run. But in the long run, there will be more benefit for the full implementation of after than in the short run. Thank you. 
very much blessing. And maybe just to assure you that, yeah, perhaps <laughs> the lexicon that we use is not very appealing, but I think really it, it is from a positive point of view to say it would serve us well to begin to think of what, to think of what are those, you know, uh, perhaps not so positive um, repercussions and what can AU institutions begin to do to support those countries um, that perhaps rely quite heavily, uh, you know, on, 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 on trade income and tariff, um, tariff income there. So I think moving slightly along, I'm going to actually pose this next question um, to Mustafa, who I know is doing quite a lot of work in this area in, in conjunction with the AFCFTA um, Secretariat to say, you know, what exactly is the AUJ NEPA doing to support some of these countries um, that might stand not to benefit as much um, from the AFCFTA? And perhaps also to add one more question um, to you as well, uh, Mustafa, that's coming from Olani, who then says, what is the role of AUDA NEPA in assisting um, governments improve in various sectors such as manufacturing, agriculture, uh, and trade facilitation, just to make sure that they are suitably positioned to be able to really benefit um, from the implementation of the AFCFTA. Over to you, Dr. Sakar. Uh, thank you, Nico, and thanks for uh, our dear participants for raising this uh, pertinent question. Uh, actually, before I uh, respond to this question, Nico, I would like just to again uh, to quickly reflect on the issue of the implementation and monitoring and evaluation of the implementation of the ACFT. Uh, as uh, mentioned by uh, George and my colleagues again, uh, along with a brilliant role uh, being played by the ACFT Secretariat, there is a lot of frameworks for monitoring the evaluation and reporting on to the implementation of the ACFT either on the continental level uh, regarding the ACFTA Secretariat, also on the regional level on, when it comes to the region economic groups, and also on the national level. As mentioned by my brother, George, there is, a, there is already ACFTA National Implementation Secretariat or offices attached in each country just to report on the implementation and raise all the challenges that, that uh, need a specific action to be taken. This is my first point. A uh, second point regard, regarding to how to uh, further uh, qualify countries to uh, better benefit from the ACFT. Actually, uh, uh, the, the development agency for uh, African Union, Audanibad, uh, runs uh, a lot of uh, thematic areas and programs and initiatives uh, to better qualify and capacitate member states. Uh, for example, when it comes to the industrialization and man manufacturing, uh, currently, uh, Audanibad. Uh, it gives a specific uh, uh, priority to, uh, for example, uh, to uh, promote the micro and small enterprises sector through the initiative uh, 100 million SMEs. Uh, we are likely to uh, conduct a lot of uh, capacity building programs to promote this sector. Uh, also, we help uh, member states to uh, promote and develop their own uh, national development plans. So, uh, and also uh, we uh, give a lot of uh, technical exp expertise when it comes to uh, the driving and implementing specific uh, industrial uh, national plans and, and activity. Uh, also, uh, we give a lot of uh, attention uh, to promote the tourism and creative sectors. Uh, also, we play a significant role as well when it comes to the trade facilitation. Uh, as you may aware, uh, Abdanibad uh, prioritizes the uh, development of one stop border uh, post across the various uh, crossing borders uh, between African countries just to ensure uh, seamless flow of goods and services across uh, the African borders. Also, uh, we currently implement uh, a specific uh, initiative to rank the efficacy of the cross borders across Africa. Again, this is to inform evidence-based uh, policy actions uh, to be taken at the various levels to mitigate all the challenges uh, confronting um, uh, growing, uh, inclusive, uh, and uh, expediting uh, intra-African trade. I hope this responds to the question. Over to Nikki. Thank you very much, Mustafa. I know it absolutely does. And I'm noting that, of course, in the chat box, there are a number of other questions coming through. Um, of course, I see some of them are being attended to uh, within the chat box as well. But really, this has been such an interesting topic that I think even goes beyond some of the modeling, uh, you know, you know, elements and work that has been done, just taking apart some of those um, other elements. Perhaps I have a last 
question um, for you, Blessing. There was something very interesting you mentioned, uh, you know, within your presentation. You spoke about the G six countries, um, and really quite keen to understand. Really, you've mentioned who those countries are, but why have they been categorized or grouped in that way? What is their common um, issue? Uh, over to you, Blessing. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, the issue, it's like, as you know, that it's like this agreement, it's about, uh, it includes the 54 African countries that are at different level of development. So these, these G6, they are saying we are facing some development challenge. We are facing some development challenges within our country. So give us some ex exceptions so that we, we don't lose more or, uh, with the implementation of after. That's why you could see that maybe uh, instead of um, being given a 10 year time period to implement, uh, to fully liberalize, they are given 13 years and for or 15 years. Because they're saying we need to prepare. We need to maybe, we need more time to, to boost our industry. We need more time to fix our problems, our local problems before we engage in, in, in the, after agreement or before we fully implement, before we remove all the tariffs. That's the issue. Yeah. Okay, no, fantastic. Thank you very much, Basin. Quite keen to see that yeah. the report does take on those issues um, as well. So thank you very much. Um, you know, unfortunately, we are going to have to uh, draw to a close. I think it has really been uh, really a, a, a great what, hour our 15 minutes um, thereabout of just robust engagement as we really delve deeper um, into the elements that relate to free trade um, on the conscious. I really want to once again um, thank you, Blessing, thank the team as well for this great work um, that, that, that has been undertaken, um, as well as to thank our two respondents, um, George and Mustafa, um, and of course, thank our participants as well. Uh, but before we close off, I still have two minutes of your time. Um, there will be a poll that should be coming onto your screen in the next couple of seconds. Um, if you could just kindly just take your time to just answer the poll, it will really help us to gauge how valuable you found this morning's session, but also will leverage on the feedback to for, for future sessions um, as well. So in closing, um, I would like to thank the teams from um, ISS and AUDA NEPAD. Uh, thank you to our discussants as well. We're really grateful as well for the support from the members of the ISS Partnership Forum. These are the Hans Seidel Foundation, the European Union, the Open Society Foundations and the governments of Denmark, Ireland, the Netherlands, Norway, um, as well as Sweden. I'm also quite excited, ladies and gentlemen, to announce uh, the details of our next session. This will take place on the 11th um, of August at 11.30 um, Central African time. And this time we are focusing on education. And the, that, that session will be titled Lifting All Boats, the effect of better quality education uh, on Africa's development. So this has been uh, an absolute pleasure on my end. Um, I would also like to thank the organizers um, as well for giving me the opportunity to moderate this session. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to wish you a brilliant afternoon and a brilliant weekend. Thank you very much and goodbye.